Hi, I'm Todd Gannon with the SciArc Channel, and I'm here tonight in conversation with Fabian Marcaccio. Fabian is a painter based in New York City. He came to prominence in the art world in the 1990s for his aggressive manipulations of the painted surface, and I think even more so for the canny reimaginations that he did of major debates of 20th century art discourse. In his early paintings, the paint seems to not be very comfortable on the canvas, you might say. The canvas leaps off the walls, the stretcher bars twist free, and even the walls pucker and morph into new configurations. His large-scale environmental paintings, digital animations, and hybrid paintings all ask serious questions about the role of painting in a digital age. His work blurs the lines between conventional distinctions like those between painting and sculpture, between abstraction and representation, between the analog and the digital, and perhaps most importantly, between the physical thrill of haptic immersion and the intellectual pleasures of critical discourse. Fabian quickly drew the attention of architects. His collaborations with Greg Lynn at the Secession Museum in Vienna in 1999 and the Wexner Center in Columbus in 2001. His work has been exhibited around the world, uh, recently in Krefeld in Germany. Uh, it's been shown here at SIAR. We're very happy to have you here tonight, Fabian. Thank um, you very much. In spite of the intelligence that's built into your work as a painter, what always got me was the idea of pleasure. You know, mm -hmm. that they like felt good to look at. It's interesting because you say pleasure because um, uh, one of my biggest problems in the so-called art world is that my work is in general considered disgusting or, or unpleasurable. I always have a problem with that because uh, it's not my intention. Yeah. Uh, uh, but, you know, uh, in, in comparison with other more uh, conventional aesthetics, mm -hmm. probably so. I always say that the, there is an eerie beauty yeah. in my work. Looking again at Roland Barthes, pleasure of mm -hmm. the text, and of course he differentiates between the text of pleasure and the text of bliss, mm -hmm. right? And the text of bliss is the one that uh, is not just about kind of ecstatic, mm -hmm. high-end pleasure, but it also has to do with loss or shock. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that that probably has a bit to do with the way uh, I see pleasure in your work. It's sometimes kind of close to pain, let's yeah, say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Certainly the paintings that you're doing in the 90s, and I think still into today in some of the more three-dimensional paintings and environmental pieces, the wall kind of peels up to meet the painting or the painting begins to kind of come apart mm -hmm. and move around or even yeah. the stretcher bars and things. There's clearly an interest on your part in activating mm -hmm. all of the material components of the painting, like everything counts. Let's say my earlier work, the so-called abstract work, let's say, I always find that my earlier work was uh, a way of trying to think about a more constellational type of work or a more like early complexity uh, painting type of work. We have this tabula rasa, let's say, that, that we end up, uh, minimalism went through, uh, and conceptual art was somehow the beginning of the end of the of the total work, let's say. Uh, what happened with that? Do we really go that way, or uh, or is is there is another way? Uh, and I felt that there was another way. Uh, I'm still this is still controversial because let's say these other tendencies are more stable, are more easy to read. Let's say like neo-formalist, neo-this, neo-that. I mean, yeah. if you open any kind of uh, painting uh, book right now, you say like, what is all this? <laughs> you know, why people are doing all these things? And I was th thought that there was a possibility of going from minimalism to macromalism, from let's say a grounded art to 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 a, a, a groundlessness art, and to somehow keep. A, a complexity or a total view of the pictorial, even in, in a, a, a seeing its, uh, uh, let's say, its entropy or its um, uh, limitations. I'm kind of always uncomfortable uh, with when people talk about end of something. When something ends, that means that there is a, uh, that it would, there was enough realization of that paradigm. Let's say minimalism. There are so many wonderful things that minimalism did, and still uh, artists are developing things in that way. But the, the paradigm itself is dead. Yeah. 
you know I mean there's no there's probably not going to be anything coming and and it's really hard to go back to uh, old models like composition in painting or things like that so my idea was to think about uh, biogenetics and uh, thinking about groundlessness and say what happened if a, a tactical kaleidoscopic here and there type of painting could be done meaning sometimes it's a panel uh, that is look like it's fighting to itself sometimes it's a, it look like a mural sometimes it's an animation yeah. uh, so painting in the uh, in an open field of possibilities without losing it good uh, let's say specificities in a lot of your earlier writings or the commentary from the the mm -hmm. painting stories catalog for instance uh, the word paradox comes up a lot mm -hmm. and yes. I think this is uh, what you're talking about that, that, that you're, mm -hmm. you're able to keep seemingly uh, unrelated concepts yes. somehow in suspension you might mm -hmm. say what I find really great about um, a lot of your work is the way that the work the, the paintings seem perfectly comfortable mm -hmm. on either side Right, you know, that right. they have that kind of theatrical presence that Freed attacked in The Minimalist. But at the same time, they seem to have that graceful presentness as mm -hmm. well, that kind of almost transcendental uh, compositional attitude. It's kind of a trick to keep those two worlds in suspension. And I mean, is this what you mean when you say that, that being able to find another way, that, that, that the kind of fight doesn't have to be one or the other, but there's an able, that you can make a kind of mutant love child out of the two sides. Right. They I, I jump from different definitions, like, like, and sometimes then, it, you know, the world never get to, to be closed to, to, let's say, to one, uh, you know, one point of view, let's say. Like, meaning you, if you see it through form, it fail. If you see it through the problem between presentation and representation, it fail. You know, like a transition, let's say, like a passage, let's say, uh, literally. So there is like a multiple failures, let's say, that that or as, and that create a certain dysfunction on the work that attract a certain strength. It's a difficult thing to say, uh, uh, let's say, quickly or simple. But there is a functional dysfunctionalism in my work. That I always thought that it would be interesting because, you know, like, uh, you guys in architecture are really, like, obviously you have functionalism and function makes more sense in an architectural context. But let's say my work doesn't function in all those arenas, but it functions between them. Yeah. But in my case, actually, I, I, I go into a certain mistrust. But the mistrust is actually not related to a bad intention toward it, but to a sense of the failure could actually be a productive, uh, you know, uh, force in the world. That, that pursuing failures within an old paradigm is a way to produce a new kind of success? It could be a constructive yeah. uh, element, let's say. I like, for instance, my 90s paintings, for instance, that you say that they stretcher bars or this or that, they create all these sort of accommodation. They almost look like shape shifters yeah. paintings. So, or I call them painting in spite of itself mm -hmm. or mutual betrayal. Because there was an attempt to say, okay, uh, uh, Mondrian was actually talking about mutual equivalence. I mean, and I love the work of Mondrian. Immediately you can think about the opposite, that is a mutual betrayal. And how the, the, the mutual uh, 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 parts of the work could actually go against each other, like in you know, one of the more uh, uh, important cultural markers that we have in, the, in terms of biology, that is cancer, for instance. And how the paradox that, for instance, these, in cancer, these cells are immortal cells. Yeah. And how we can actually maybe, if we harvest them or we in, in understand them, we could actually understand their dysfunction. Mm -hmm. Probably that example actually is, uh, it, it comes uh, to, uh, to see how dysfunction could function. Right. Let's say. And so it seems that the dysfunction that you pursue in the work is often, it's helped, let's say, by 
confiscating skills or possibilities from other fields, whether it be mm -hmm. digital technology, which I think gives you that scale effect, mm -hmm. but viscerally, right? So when you stand in front of a painting mm -hmm. and you feel like you're looking at the canvas right. from the size of a gnat right. or something. Yeah, I mean, the, and there is actually almost like a logical, uh, when I, I was start talking about the bombardment of the genes in like my f early 90s work, I was uh, looking a lot about biogenetics, the early the state of biogenetics, and then the, the uh, you know, the codification of the genome, and like how that interior collage, or interior impact, let's say, could be actually uh, an interesting model to think about a altered painting. I was thinking more about the idea of making a, a, you know, making a type of painting that will be in constant paradox with itself. Yeah. Like for instance, you will see literally things that don't happen in painting. Not because of gravity, not because of, uh, you know, all kinds of issues. Let's say a painting making love with a wall through an umbilical cord, enter into a, uh, you know, a, this, a nervous system, a pictorial nervous system, or painting eclipsing, or, or painting, you know, attacking the wall. All those kinds of things were actually how to make uh, this, again, this functional or painting attacking itself yeah. as a productive force. Everything that you're describing seems to have to do with pursuing an almost Clement Greenberg kind of self-criticism of the material fact of the painting. Definitely it's not about illustration. My work is never about illustration. It's more about structural models, let's say, and how, uh, you know, pictorial models dialogue with scientific model, political, mo you know, mm -hmm. uh, political science model. Let's say in the advent of photography and film and all that, uh, painting start having a kind of a complex of inferiority, let's say, mm -hmm. and it, it went all the way to realize itself into minimalism and into a really, like, a, almost most narrow stage, let's say. So when I talk about cancer or bio, biology or biogenetics, they're actually more like models to echo yeah. in a way. So uh, I think that I believe in the, in, the, uh, in the dialogue between models, let's say linguistic models, you know, pictorial models. I find that painting is part of, um, of a kind of more wet, a more uh, kind of more sordid, type yeah. of paradigm. But painters have this sort of alchemy, a wet culture. It's almost like if you think that, let's say you had a linguistic, let's say the phonetic, the sounds that come in our, our mouth and, and the writing text yeah. that is aerial. The pictorial thinking is more like, the, the, there's no distance to the material. I would say that my work is actually more like, like a way that you enter the body through uh -huh. biogenetics, and you alter painting inside the decooning. The picture is always multidimensional. Right. That's why my work, you can have a panel, or a panel went that way, or sometimes it cross a building like a, like a, like a frozen movie, uh -huh. or sometimes it's an animation, or sometimes it's, you know, again, there are different, let's say, renderings or territorializations of painting. Mm -hmm. So it's multidimensional. And let's talk about that in specific to architecture. I mean, uh, so we know you've collaborated with Greg on a couple mm -hmm. of things. Yep. You collaborated with Mies. We're sitting in his chairs yes. now. Well, and, yeah. uh, you know, I wonder, I wonder about that. I mean, do you see the relationship between painting and architecture as similarly uh, disruptive in the way that, say, the digital disrupts painting or that the, the kind of silicone disrupts mm -hmm. the colors that you use? I mean. Well, when I, I mean, I met, uh, you know, Greg Lean, he was a teacher in Columbia University during the 90s, and my wife, Galia Solomonov, was a student, not of Greg, actually, but of St Stan Allen. Mm -hmm. But I started visiting, uh, uh, the, you know, the, the, uh, the Columbia University, that was the, somehow almost like the laboratory, the digital laboratory, yeah. and I was really impressed by the ideas that he was talking about. He was talking about biology and about animational and events. Mm -hmm. and, and I was, I feel really connected because I was thinking about the same ideas in the pictorial. Right. So the, uh, uh, collaborating with Greg was, um, 
really pleasurable, by yeah. the way. But at the same time, we are, it looked like we were flowing in the same direction. I find it interesting that on one hand, you know, given the interest in disruption or mm -hmm. mutation or, or kind of disturbance of, of some kind, when two fields kind of come together or mm -hmm. when two sets of ideas come together, that coming together with architecture uh, seems to produce a kind of smoother synthesis. And is that always the case? Or do you think is this, well, this was more your relationship with Greg as opposed to your relationship with architecture? I say that, uh, you know, I'm touched by certain, um, uh, you know, research, um, certain models that architects do mm -hmm. and th that architects have been working with, as I was touched by some music movement, uh, music models that some musicians actually work and some models that are actually uh, filmmakers, maybe, sometimes. But I think it's more a, a sort of admiration, yeah. and at the same time, uh, a, a way of collaborating and not melting. Yeah. Uh, uh, an idea of respecting, uh, let's say, specificities, mm -hmm. and, of course, risking mistakes, of course, and risking overlaps. But uh, my relation with Greg was always uh, of uh, well, you are actually acting more like an architect. Well, I'm sorry. Well, I'm acting more like a painter. Well, I'm sorry. So it was almost like a let it be, you know? It yeah. was, we presented and there was a lot of uh, a calculation, but at the same time, let's say a lot of strategy, but at the same time, a lot of tactical maneuvers. My father was a contractor. I mean, he had a construction company and he always uh, grew up in buildings that were in the making. So uh, my feeling is always been in a construction site. So whenever I go yeah. uh, into a construction site and I see the whole process of thinking to toward and being in the process of the construction uh, is already like almost like feel like home or like the materialization of uh, let's say certain ideas into material. I actually connect uh, to um, you know. Uh, Hernan, for instance, is kind of interesting because we connect, I think, in a pretty carnal way. Uh, uh, it's really interesting because uh, I met him through in Columbia University too, yeah. and, uh, and I was always interested about his visceral approach. I want to return uh, to this idea of the visceral, because I think this is a big deal in your work, and I think the... Um, this maybe helps to relate it back to some of the things that Hernan does as well. When the work shifts into a kind of realism, and there's mm -hmm. the carnality is in the, the USA stories, for instance, the carnality has to do with fairly gruesome current events. And what I realized was that, that the kind of pleasure that I always felt when I would encounter one of your paintings in a gallery, all of the elements were still there. Mm -hmm. But when I also know that it's the kind of Columbine shooters mm -hmm. that are somehow in the DNA as well, mm -hmm. there's, uh, it, it's revolting in a way. It's not unrelated to, I think, some of the stuff that Hernan is doing with the, with the cows and the skins and right. the butchery and things. And I wonder about it. I mean, is that I, an intentional I, move to kind of change well, the register? I, if you see my work, again, I don't think that my early work, like let's say the, the alter genetic of painting, I always felt like there was animational work. It was almost like taking the tissues of painting and rerun them in a... Uh, and they, I never saw them, actually. They're more like figurative ghosts, mm -hmm. the painting. It's almost like you're trying to, to say, okay, painting is no longer with us. Then what do you have? The body, the dead body, or you got the ghost? And it was, they are ghost paintings, pretty much. And they are ghosts of figurative paintings, really. They are ghosts of the absence of, or the impossibility of iconography, let's say. But then as the work uh, grows, there is a lot of signage, and yeah. there is a lot of like comparisons and combinations of so-called formal elements, or in my case, I would say rhetorical elements, mm -hmm. uh, with signage, with ideological processes. Mm -hmm. Let's say like a typical uh, painting of, of the night, it was actually uh, a tent, I call it tent paintings, because it would look like a little bit like a advertising yeah. or a pancarta, mm -hmm. you know? And they, they had this sort of more like a kind of, what is this, a political pancarta? Or, or like a banner or an advertising. Or a tent. It is the advertising of 
ghost painting, let's say, yeah. or, or is, is somehow, okay, painting could not be grounded because it was already grounded, so why not to run, let's say, a painting that is almost like an X-ray of painting? And, and in, in that way, for instance, one of my favorite ones was actually, uh, I was really interested in seeing the political uh, uh, implications, actually, of the, of the Bosnia and Herzegovina and the militia movement mm -hmm. in America. And what's really interesting about this, uh, this model that a lot of uh, political thinkers were thinking that war acts inside peace much more than before. Let's say that the only way to create war is like a sort of like a constant civil war inside peace. Uh -huh. And we are so used to that right now. Again, like when we talk early on, those pieces are actually are not really abstract pieces, but are actually more like some kind of uh, uh, mapping mm -hmm. of ideological and formal processes. And to me, those were representation, one of the only ways of representing and keeping, let's say, analytical ideas in painting and right. somehow analyzing the present, mm -hmm. you know? Instead of like you, you do a, a documentary or that, so, and then I went all the way, I mean, the paintings pretty much are almost like analysis of contemporary problems yeah. uh, in a freeze. Like for instance, about globalism, about uh, violence, uh, again, in a, the, I did one, I mean, if you read the titles, that one is called St the Rest Catching Democracy, mm -hmm. that is about the thinking of what state of democracy we're living right now. So they are, again, f uh, they are uh, like, trying to compare uh, political models, scientific models, and pictorial models coming all together. And the new work is actually, is quite interesting because I start trying to actually create a kind of more hyper material painting. Yeah. Because I was going so much high into painting that I want to come down a little right. bit. So you just get a little bit lower, <laughs> you know? Because yeah. I was too high and the whole world was becoming virtual, let's say. So I say, I want to do the opposite. I want to try to territorialize again. And that was the moment actually when, when three-dimensional printing started. And actually, I think three-dimensional printing, especially because of the popularity, is a really interesting territorializer. It's almost yeah. like, yeah, you got it, the digital goes here, virtual, virtual, territorialized. And then, and then maybe virtual again, territorialized. And it's that sort of bumpy road that we're going right now. Uh -huh. And to me, I try actually, to tell you the truth, I try to make this, I call it raw paintings, because it's an exaggeration of materiality. Uh, I try to actually make them just abstract, but they didn't work at all. Yeah. So I have to have a, I have to create a connection because there was there was a, one of the more interesting things about these paintings is that you pass through them through your eyes and mm -hmm. through your body. Right. So the micro macro uh, will not happen if there was not at least a resonance of a subject. The paintings, like your eye goes through the painting literally. Yes. In a traditional painting, your eye has the illusion of traveling into a deep space. Exactly. And the kind of uh, the, the dissonance between those two mm -hmm. possibilities in paintings right. come together. The interesting thing about the, let's say, a painting like this, the Waco, Texas massacre. Yeah. You see? To me, the, the, the analysis of this model, the moment of like, of the drama of the painting, let's say, trying to actually contract myself and to create a painting that nobody's going to represent, because I knew that actually uh, everything will be tend to forget this subject, let's say. Right. It was almost like perverse. How could I actually create almost as a situation that if the people from the, the, uh, the disaster will contract me as an painter uh -huh. uh, to, to paint their subject? And to me, the, one of the interesting things is like, the ground of the painting as a landscape, let's say. The ground of the painting you can see through, but the fire, the disaster, you can't. Mm -hmm. So it's a really interesting uh, a pictorial model that again connect to the historical uh, situation and resonate to the uh, political uh, model where there was what it means that these, uh, let's say, separatist movements are 
uh, let's say, trying to disassociate from our, let's say, liberal culture, let's right. say or liberal, illuministic culture. And to me, that's actually a pretty interesting thing. And again, it's the, f the friction between different models. Well, I think that was fascinating. Thank you very much, Fabian, and we'll see you next time on the SciArc Channel.